you know, one in 10 households in America are considered millionaires. But only one in 25,000 Americans have a six pack. Just think of how few people are millionaires with six packs. Like that. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. Today we have a special guest, a dear friend of ours, a former veteran, real estate expert, international speaker, mentor, educator, CEO and founder of Clever Investor, flipped over a thousand properties, north of $180 million, and has the most followed real estate Instagram account with 1.2 million followers. So mm. with further ado, welcome to the show, Cody Sperber. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me on, guys. Cody, thanks for coming. Um, we're going to get into like how we met a few years ago, a little bit later in the show, but maybe for now, just like, can I walk us through how you got started in real estate? Like, your well, first can, deal? Can, can I tell you how proud of I am of you two? I am so proud of you guys to to what to be able to be part of your journey up to this point. Now to be on your podcast, pretty cool. Well, thanks, you know, I, I, I want to talk about that because I mean, you guys have really crushed it in the real estate business. And it's been cool to watch. So I'm glad. And I'm sitting in your fancy office and on the elevator right up here telling me about the gazillion properties <laughs> you're building and all the cool things you're doing. I'm just, I'm just so, I'm like beaming. I'm so proud of you guys. Very cool. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks man. Yeah. All right. So what do you want to know? So how, how, I made, how, how, how I made my bajillions? Yeah, how you <laughs> yeah. made your bajillions, how you got started. And then, you know, because you're actually a big part of how we started, right? So let, let's start with how you got into this and then we'll, we'll touch base on how we met uh, yeah, th I, I, you know, you can sometimes come on podcasts and you repeat the same, like, come up story. So I'm going to give you the super short Cliff Notes version. I wanted to be a marine biologist or a history professor as a little kid. That's how big my vision was. It wasn't, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go out and get rich. Um, and I, uh, I'm a lot of, ser a series of events happened in my life, and probably people listening can relate to this. It's, it's like these like moments where like you're like recalibrated or um, you, you, it's like a pivotal moment. You don't realize it at the time, like how valuable that moment is. But like me going to college for uh, a few hours and being so uncomfortable knowing that that wasn't for me and feeling so out of place and not prepared and, and just the anxiety out of control that I literally w went to college for like two hours and then left and never went back. Like I was like, screw this place. I'm out of here. Uh, a lot of people get pressured into going to school by their parents or something like that, and they just tough it out. And I was like, you know what? This isn't for me. I made the call. I walked out. Eventually joined the military. Another pivotal moment. Fan I, at the time, I didn't realize how good that was going to be to get me out of the toxic negative environment I was in and where I grew up and my friend group that I had. And we were doing a lot of drugs. We were selling drugs, smoking weed. And, um, and you get disconnected from that. Next thing you know, you're off in the military. And I'm traveling the world. And I, you know, when you travel, something beautiful happens. I've been over 30, 40 countries. You get exposed to a extreme poverty. Other cultures and religions and things and life lessons happen as you're out there, you know, as a kid traveling around and working in the military. Uh, I care deeply all of a sudden about my physique. I care deeply about my stuff. I started to have more confidence. I grew while I was in the military. I started... Uh, having some game with the ladies, having some fun. You know, I was having a lot of fun. Um, and uh, it just disconnected me from a lot of the things. My fr A lot of my friends went to juvenile hall, maybe prison, things like that. Um, there was a guy named Derek who was like a neighborhood bully. He, he got killed in front of us because um, he was picking on this other kid named Matt. And Matt stole his grandpa's gun and shot Derek in front of us. Like that kind of stuff was happening in my neighborhood. It's not like I was in this like war zone or anything like that. I just was, I needed to be disconnected from it. And so coming out of the military, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I went and talked to my uh, history professor at San Diego state. I left that meeting thinking history professors out. They don't make any money. The dude had two jobs just to survive. Like he, he loves history, but he hated his financial situation. And he was kind of an unhappy guy. And I remember just thinking to myself, I'm not going to be an unhappy history professor. Like this sucks. 
And also, while I was in the military, I got violently seasick every time we left port. Well, that's not a good... No, no, I joined the... I, you know, it's like you join the Navy. I live in Arizona. There's no ocean. I had never been on a ship before. <laughs> and now I'm getting... I'm throwing up on the side of the, the <laughs> ship every time we leave. So I'm like, I'm not going to be a marine biologist. And uh, I, just another lucky thing happened in my life. My friend, Jeremy, flipped a house, made a bunch of money, asked me to go to lunch, pulls up in a cool car... How'd you get the car? Flipped the house. And I, back then, this is 18, 19 years ago, I had never heard of wholesaling. I did not know this world existed. And he literally, in a lunch period, penciled out wholesaling on a napkin. And it just changed the way I thought about real estate. Because I, I always wanted to be in real estate. But I thought real estate is what rich people did or real estate agents did. I had no clue that a, a, a guy, a former weed smoke in, you know, Navy guy can get into real estate and be super successful. And so, uh, I went down this rabbit hole and, uh, tried to teach myself real estate, real estate investing and creative real estate back then. No Facebook, no YouTube, none of that stuff. There was no podcast to listen to from you guys schooling me. There was no Cody Sperber, the clever investor putting out content. And so I, uh, uh, used to read the newspaper and find gurus that were putting on seminars, fly all over the country. I would put it on my credit card and I would go to these seminars and I'd buy whatever the guru was selling. If this guru was selling books and tapes, I'm buying it. If it, a boot camp, I'm in, right? You want to do a workshop? Count me in. And they loved me because I bought everything, right? I just would, <laughs> I would roll in and at some point I just have given up trying to not buy stuff. I would just throw my credit card up on the stage and be like, just charge me. I'll show up whenever you tell me. But that's how obsessed I was in the beginning about learning this business. Because I, I just felt something inside me that said like, this is your path. Um, unfortunately, they don't tell you how much overwhelm you get when you approach it like that. Yeah, you know, it was like drinking from a fire hose. I just got totally overwhelmed. It took me 14 months to do my first deal. Tell us about your first deal. Well, I, uh, it was a bankruptcy, divorce, and a foreclosure. It was like a trifecta. And by this point in my journey, I had already quit the business and then restarted the business. You know, I'm, 14 mo I'm 12 months in before I f got a mentor. 14 months before I popped that first deal. So just imagine, for anybody listening, you're gunning for 14 months. You tried to quit 100 times. You successfully quit at least once for four months. I went and got a job as a bookkeeper. But I'm still coming back. Like, I keep circling back because something was pulling me back in. And that voice in your head, that self-limiting beliefs, and that just the way you think about success and can I do this and do I deserve to be successful and your parents are sitting you down at one point saying you're making a mistake and your girlfriend's shitting all over your dream saying go get a fucking job because this is ridiculous and it's not happening fast enough and your credit card bills are stacked up because you bought all these books and tapes everything was like against me plus I look like I'm 15 years old right like I'm a young looking guy I'm thinking who's going to take me seriously and do a deal with me and I did it's not like I had a bunch of money I'm trying to make magic happen. Uh, but I finally found a mentor, and I smartened up this, that last push. I got this mentor. His name was Lyle Wall. And I met him at an event, and I convinced him to be my mentor, and I paid him to be my mentor, but I convinced him to work with me. And it took me, from the time I finally had somebody who had had a ton of success like him, really stop all the BS, stop me doing all the things I shouldn't be doing, focus me on the two or three things that I should be doing, was in my corner helping me, uh, coaching me, and just holding me accountable to things. Within two months, I get this deal. But the challenge is, I still didn't know really what I was doing. I understood wholesaling, the concept. I kind of understood the paperwork, but I had never done a deal up to this point. And so when I went to Lyle and I said, hey, dude, I got this foreclosure bankruptcy divorce scenario. It's a lead. The guy's been approached a hundred times. I have no idea what I'm doing. What do I do? Give me words of wisdom. And this is what I love about a great mentor. It's not like he sat there and goes, okay, let me teach you everything about bankruptcy. Let me teach you everything about foreclosure. Let me teach you everything about divorce and how attorneys work and how this is going to go down. He just said, Cody, none of the technical stuff matters in the beginning. The only thing that matters is when you go to this appointment, you show up and you're, you do two things. You are extremely enthusiastic and you're extremely authentic. And if you do those two things, you're, you, you will get this deal. 
And I'm looking at him. I'm like, dude, I fucking paid you. I've been sacrificing for 60 days listening to you ramble as you whiteboarded out different concepts. And that's your advice to me? Be authentic and enthusiastic? Like, where's the Yoda wisdom? Like, what, what, are you, what, are you, what am I going to do when he asks me something about something and I don't have the answer? He said, dude, just be authentic and be enthusiastic. You'll figure it out. I go to this appointment, and uh, the guy was pissed off. He's been ran over in life. He's got attorneys telling him that he's got to sell his house and split the profits with his soon-to-be ex-wife, and he's got to pay all these debts, and he's just angry. And uh, when I showed up, I didn't know what I was doing. I actually parked down the street because I was embarrassed by my pickup truck. It was a piece of shit. So I was nervous to, like, even park it in the front because if he looked at my car, he'd know instantly I couldn't pay cash for his house. And as I was walking to his property, the neighbor was out watering his lawn, and I stopped and talked to the neighbor, and I said, hey, dude, I'm going to go look at this house. How do you like the neighborhood? And he goes, oh, I forget the guy's name now, but he goes, oh, uh, you're going over to John's house. Yeah, good luck with that. He's literally told everybody to fuck off, and there's been 100 people here. (laughs) You're like, let's go. (laughs) Oh, I'm like, oh, great. This is going to go well. And so after that, I'm, I'm super nervous, you know, and I go up to this guy's door and I knock on it and he opens it up and he's pissed off and he's guarded and all the things. And I talked to him in the front of his house a little bit and I introduced myself and I said, I'm Cody. I'm the guy that set the appointment with you. And, you know, he's given me very little information, but I just kept talking and I kept asking questions. I wasn't trying to be an expert. I wasn't trying to impress him. I was just saying, asking question after question after question and letting him, like, tell me things. And after about 15 minutes of standing in his doorway, he finally invited me in. And I thought to myself, shit, I'm getting in the house. Like, this is great. Like, this is a good step. I wasn't getting in a lot of other houses. Like, I'm getting in the house. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm asking him more questions. And they're questions like, you know, what's it like going through a divorce? If you were to give me any advice being young, like, how would I not fuck up a marriage? And he was almost like coaching me and mentoring me. It's like I flipped the tables on him by just asking great open-ended questions, Um, not even really talking about the real estate as much. About an hour in to this guy's house, we're building a relationship, and he looks at me and goes, Cody, are you hungry? And I said, yeah, I guess I am hungry. And he goes, I'm making spaghetti. You want to eat with me? I said, sure. He cooks me spaghetti. We we're eating this food. I'm at his dinner table. He's, tell, he's crying now. He's telling me his whole life story and all this wonder, wonderful rapport building is happening. And then finally, I just stopped him and I said, dude, I, I got to be honest with you. I'm not even qualified to help you here today. Like, I'm going to do everything in my power to try to help you. But I'm not the guy to buy your house. I don't know anything about divorce, bankruptcy, or foreclosure. I hired this guy, mentor, this mentor, Like, he's kind of coaching me through, but I haven't even done a deal yet. Like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And about two, three minutes later, he just said, Cody, is that your pen right there? And I said, yeah. And he goes, is that your contract to do a deal? I said, yeah. And he said, slide it over here. I want to do a deal with you. I couldn't believe it. (laughs) I couldn't believe it. And I didn't even know how to fill out the paperwork. I was so nervous. And we read the paperwork together. And, oh, I think you sign here. I think you initial here. I think. And, uh. You know, I left there and I got the deal and I, then, then I figured things out. Then I called the attorneys. Then I went back to Lyle. I got a contract. What do I do next? Then he stepped in and started coaching me. I didn't need all that information. That, the lesson in this is you don't need all the information ahead of time. You will figure it out. But you'll never get a contract signed if you can't learn how to build a relationship with somebody, really connect with somebody, understand that person. I realized that moment that day, I'm in the people business not in the real estate business. And if I can learn how to connect fast and influence and persuade people, I could do anything. This works in entrepreneurship, scaling businesses, because what is the true purpose of being an entrepreneur? I mean, think about this. It's not to be the guy that knows how to do everything. Like I could be a great technician, like a great, uh, we see this all the time with like chefs. A chef wants to break away and go start his own restaurant. They think because they're a great chef, they're going to go be a great restaurant owner. And that's just not the, I mean, they go out of business faster than any other potential entrepreneur. That's because the real job of an entrepreneur is enrolling other people into your vision and creating alignment with them 
so they can help you implement the vision. It's enrolling, and that's a very powerful word, enrolling. You guys have enrolled a lot of people over your time span here doing this business. You're enrolling contractors, you're enrolling money partners, you're enrolling you know people that work here in this office to help you transact and get the deals done. Um, that's really all we do. And once I understood that, I was like, God, I don't have to be the person leading the meetings, coming up with all the best advice, doing all the pieces of the puzzle. I just need to learn how to get people in the right seat of the bus, move them around, enroll them in my vision, get them to understand what's in it for them if they do it with me. And that's when the magic happens. So now here I am today, thousands of deals later, own a development company called Green Elephant Development with my two best friends. We got 26 houses going up right now. Uh, lots of, you know, these are two to three and a half million dollar houses all in Scottsdale, Biltmore Corridor, PV area. Nothing like what you guys are doing. You guys are doing the big boy stuff. We're like two layers below what you guys are doing. Uh, but we're doing 26 of them, which is scary and exciting at the same time. You know, we're, we make about four hundred to 700000 per property, except for our last three. Our last three, because the market turned, we lost 30 grand on one. I lost 60 grand on another because we overbuilt and we didn't, we, we, we pre-sold it and overbuilt. Oh, yeah. We lost 30 grand on another one because we um, had some issues at the last minute that we had to fix and we care more about brand than we do about profit. And then the last one, this is a great lesson for anybody listening. Um, I raised private money from a good friend of mine. She's really, really rich. And I, my pitch to her was, hey, you're going to give me 300 grand, and I'm going to give you 25% of this deal. Our last 15 deals, we're averaging like four, five, 600 grand in profit. So if you give me 300 grand, I'm probably going to give you 400 grand back or more. It's a phenomenal return. This is when the market's really good, like a year and a half ago. Yeah. She says, cool. She didn't even hesitate. She wired the money instantly. Two months before the project ends, I asked my partner, Garrett, hey, how are we doing with this project? He said, I think we're on time and on budget. I think we're going to be good. And we pre-sold this, by the way, locked in our profits already. And, I, and we were expecting to make about 400 grand in profit. So I'm thinking we're going to nail what we told the investor. We're going to nail our numbers and all that. So I give a report back to my friend. Hey, we're on track, on budget, should close in two months, maybe two and a half months. Two weeks before the project closes, I get a phone call, frantic phone call from my partners that said, we're going to lose money on this deal. And I'm like, no fucking way. What are you talking about? Like, we just had a meeting two months ago. Like, there's no way we're losing money. He goes, the buyer is kind of a, like a terrorist. He's asking for all this extra stuff. Like, in the last two months, we blew through the budget. And I think I miscalculated. I wasn't, my numbers weren't dialed in as far as I thought they were. And now that we're running the final balance sheet and P&Ls and everything, we might lose money on this deal. And I'm like, there is no fucking way I'm going back to my partner or to my investor and saying we're losing money. Now, we personally guaranteed the loan, so she would have lost nothing. But imagine giving somebody like a Cody Sperber 300 grand, expecting to make 400, only to get a phone call saying, I'm giving you a 300 back, but you're not making any money after 14 months. Not going to happen. Well, we crunched the numbers. We ended up making 56K on the deal. We called her up and, uh, Per our contract, we only had to give her 25% of 56 grand. I gave her all $56,000 because the reason I've been in business for 20 years, the, the reason people love to do business with me and lend me money and be around me is because I always protect my, my, my word and what we agreed upon, even though on paper I only have to give her 25%. The right thing to do was to play the long game because I knew she would relend us money in the future. So we gave her everything but $1. And I framed that dollar and put it in a plaque and I put it on Garrett's wall to remind us as a business that even though you got 26 houses and this and, and every entrepreneur can relate to this, like you're never going to be deadly accurate 100% unless you're staring at every little spreadsheet all day and you have like just a dedicated person. But when you're kind of you know, a group of guys just like hustling and doing business and doing houses and stuff. It's hard to always be perfectly accurate, especially with COVID and supply chain and all this other stuff. And so I, we were off and it was Garrett's fault. 
and we made zero dollar. Well, we made one dollar <laughs> after fourteen months of building a house. Yeah, I mean, we we've had that happen to us before, and we did the same thing you did. Basically, said you know, investors come first. Um, you know, we never lost any of our investors; they're all happy with it. So. Um, I, I think I agree, and, and especially in the beginning, actually, our first few deals were not, like, super lucrative, right? But kind of what you said earlier, we kept going, which I think is kind of for, you know, most people don't know that about us, but we actually started pretty much with you uh, 2017. We did a two-and-a-half-day, I think it was a $199 course in a hotel in Tempe. Um, and what's kind of amazing, and we talked about the other day, we sold since then over 400 million worth of residential estate. So, and hey, that's a round of applause <laughs> right there. And I think the funny thing when you talked about the first deal, the first deal we did was on that seminar. And uh, you probably don't remember because you have so many of them, but there was a challenge to have three calls or something we had to do the night. And we did a list and we kind of went overboard and did a whole like, spreadsheet of Excel with every <laughs> single for sale by owner we could find on Craigslist yeah. that night. And, <laughs> We bought a deal in Surprise, Arizona the next day. It. During Yeah, we drove Saturday after we were done at the meeting. We drove out to Surprise. We've never been there. Um, and we bought the house for like 210000 with no money. And she, ba I mean, it was it was uh, interesting. We wholesaled it. And, we, I mean, we made like 2500 bucks. That was, a, that was a real surprise up there. Never been there. Big surprise. <laughs> no clue. First deal. Surprise and surprise. <laughs> we had no hey, idea. you made 2500 bucks. <laughs> that was a lot of money. Yeah, and here's the thing. What's cool is, I was the first one in the industry to do deal making workshops that way. Yep. And we did it for that reason. Yeah. Because I was so sick and tired of like theory. Yeah. Like, dude, just roll up your sleeves and figure it out. And here's what's interesting. You're you're part of the 10%. How many people buy courses, go to seminars, think they want to do real estate and hit a few roadblocks, few challenges, and they're out? Yeah, 90 some percent. We actually, one of the guys we met at the seminar, Isaac, he's still with us today. Like, yeah. he door knocked with us the first couple of months. He, st he was sleeping in his pickup truck. He's still with us. He sold probably 30 million real estate since <sighs> I he started. Love this story. So, that's all coming from, uh, you know, basically the, uh, the, the workshop we did with you. Um, and then Max and I did like one of those extended workshops with you a couple of months later. But um, kind of walk us through how Clever Investor works. Like, how are you guys set up? Um, we know you have that new big office and everything. Like, tell us a little about the operation, Clever. Yeah, so Clever is one of my companies. It's an online education company. I started it in 2009 officially, like really was gunning by 2010. So I'm one of the older school, new school guys. So I mean, there's been real estate gurus forever. Um, they just didn't digitize it and didn't go online as aggressively as I did. And I just happened to be right at the forefront of social media being born. So I saw, as a young guy that was more nimble and more tech savvy, I saw the trend and I got on Facebook really early, LinkedIn really early, and got aggressive with content creation. So like now, the reason I have a million followers on IG and you know hundreds of thousands of followers on all the other platforms is just I was early and I was consistent. And so uh, we're we're you know we're doing really well. Uh, last year we had one of our best years. Uh, we throw one major event per year, typically in Vegas. Um, it was called Clever Summit. We had 3,000 people show up to that and about another seven to 8,000 watch it online. And uh, just through that process, over 80, 90,000 students have come through my program. Guys like you, actually, women are actually some of my best students are women. Most of my best students are women. You guys are the anomaly, you know, because women have so much emotional intelligence when they really understand and they can. They can pair their emotional intelligence with a little bit of that, like, cutthroat, like, bitch energy with hardcore skills and capabilities. They're, like, unstoppable. Like, all of my best acquisition reps in my office are women because they're fucking killers. And they just maneuver through relationships and they just get deals done. And I, um, But I've created, I don't even know how many millionaires, well over, you know, hundreds and hundreds, maybe over a couple thousand. I don't even know. And a lot of people don't, you know, we have thousands of testimonies, but we don't know, you know, how yeah, it, some people take our skills that we teach them and then go start another business outside of real estate. And we're just kind of like their first catalyst to getting into entrepreneurship. Um, my favorite thing about Clever is this right here. You know, I never got into Clever to make money. It happened to scale. I've done over a hundred million dollars so far online. I had to teach myself copywriting, funnel building, 
content creation, course creation, how to throw an event, how to do fulfillment, how to scale a company. Like I didn't know any of this. I'm a real estate dude that does real estate that loves what it did for me and my family so much. And because I wanted to be a teacher, I was like, dude, I got to talk about this. So my, I didn't know Clever was going to scale. I didn't really care. Honestly, I just wanted this. I wanted to be able to like share my passion with real estate with other passionate people and be like, yo, let's go do deals. Let's go have fun. Let's go make money and see where it leads through the creating the clever brand. Then eventually my personal brand and then getting the blue check mark on IG was like a, a game changer for me because I was one of the first ones to really like build like a real estate brand on IG. Other people outside of the industry started reaching out to me. So, like, now some of my favorite human beings like Joel Marion and Dan Fleischman are my business partners in our masterminds. So, all of a sudden, I started starting other businesses outside of the real estate game from masterminds to software companies to data companies, um, uh, other online education companies for entrepreneurs, just, like, really cool stuff. And that's it. But as an owner of just a tie full little bow on all this. Now I have the development company. I have Clever Investor. I have all the interest in all these other companies. I started Osnap, which is a network marketing supplement company because I'm, I, I'm like on this tear lately because I'm like on this health kick, right? Like first thing you said when, when I got out of the car, like, dude, you're looking beefy. That's because I'm working really hard on my health. You know, I'm, I'm almost 45 and, uh, it matters. Your health matters. I give up all my money for better health instantly. And my mom passed away last year from cancer. And it's a great reminder when you lose somebody really close to you, just how limited our time here is on earth and how important it is to be healthy. And I want to be an anomaly. You know, one in 10 households in America are considered millionaires, but only one in 25,000 Americans have a six pack. Just think of how few people are millionaires with six packs. I like that. And my, I have a friend who taught me how I hired him. His name's Wes Watson. I, I hired him to coach me on counting macros and like meal planning and like holding me accountable when I was first starting my fitness journey. And uh, he used to say this phrase. He, he accidentally said it one day. He said, you know, Cody, like our number one goal here is to get you ripped, rich, and rare. And when he said it, it resonated with me. I was like, damn, I want to be ripped, rich, and rare. And then I was talking to my other friend, Spectacular Smith, last year. I was going through this really hard time, and it was the end of the year, and we were getting ready to go into 2023. And he goes, dude, 2023 is going to be the year of winnergy. And so those two things have been rattling around in my head this entire year so far. It's like I want to be ripped, rich, and rare, and I want to win, and I want to have winnergy. And so... uh, we started this supplement company called Osnap last year, and uh, it's going really well. We're having a ton of fun with it, and uh, bought a ton of Airbnbs last year, over over forty or fifty of them, luxury Airbnbs all over the place. My my game plan is to own like fifty of the dopest houses all over the world. It's all short term, all short term rentals, and you know I'm going to buy a private jet here soon, and I'm just going to eventually get to a point where my real estate is cash flowing so aggressively like we're getting into multifamily really really strong we stopped buying all single family we're done with 20 in the beginning of 2023 we stopped all purchasing of single family we're only doing multifamily now um i have a 294 unit in georgia i have an 81 unit over by asu that we're an investor in and we're just looking to build and buy and do as much multifamily as possible started a fund and we're getting aggressive with raising money And I can envision a day, um, I got my little private jet and uh, got my houses all over the world and just going from one to the other, just kind of living the real estate investor lifestyle. We'll we'll sign up for that today, I guess. Um, Let's go. I love it. Um, You mentioned uh, Osnap and a couple of other companies. We were recently at one of your events where you invited us over to your new building in Tempe. Mm -hmm. Tell us uh, what this is about because when I got there, I was like, this is absolutely amazing. Which one? Uh, How Osnap works? No, the actual building and and how you set things up. Yeah, so look, why do people get in? You know, if you really think about money in the money game, there are rules to this game. 
if you are just working at a job earning earned income, you're in the worst tax bracket, you're really not in the money game. You're a pawn in somebody else's money game. And the first step to getting out of the rat race and bridging the gap between being broke all the time and not having leftover money at the end of every month and getting over onto the rich, wealthy side is starting a business, right? That, like, that's step one, like learn how to start a business. And if you don't know how to start a business, get around guys like you, right? Get that proximity to people who are doing business. And in, even if I had to work for you guys for free, what did you say the guy's name was that was sleeping in his car? Oh, Isaac. Isaac. Yeah. Isaac. Yeah. Isaac did whatever the hell he had to do yeah. to get a spot on the squad to learn and get that proximity to learn business. That's what people need to do. And, and most people are wussies out there, dude. They talk a big game, and they don't follow through. And the second things get harder, the second somebody shits on their dream, or the second uh, they run out a little bit of money or they get in the pressure cooker just a little bit, they change directions or they recede. And it's just so sad how many people's self-limiting beliefs short change them from their potential. And so step one, get in the money game by starting a business. Because when you have an LLC, you have different um, tax benefits. You have access to different types of capital. You can now use leverage, which is other people's time, money, skills, and resources. You can't do that when you're working a job. Then the next layer is like, how do I invest my, how do I get into the investing game? Can my business earn enough money where I can pay myself really well to go in and put it into action for me? Or can my business be an investing business? That's like kind of what we did, right? It's like the best of both worlds. It's like, let's go start a business and be investors all at the same time. And uh, so reason I love real estate is one, it's tangible. I could touch it. I can kind of sort of control it. Like I can't control stocks and Bitcoin and all this other stuff. Um, And when I buy a building like that, like last year was one of my best years financially ever. My tax bill was going to be millions and millions of dollars. But I bought one badass commercial asset for 4.25 million. Put another million into it. Turned it into this amazing 18,000 square foot compound. We built an event center My development company's out of there. I rented three of the other, because the way the building is, it's like like a, a, a square with a, a courtyard in the middle. And so we have, uh, 3000 square foot suites. We have six of them. I rented out three of them at $6,000 each. So that's 18,000 worth of income coming in. Then I turned one of the suites into an event center that we ran out to other people that produces, it's going to produce about a hundred and $50,000 a year in income. So that now pays for itself. I run my other companies out of it. Oh, snap, clever investor, GED, all my companies so quick for cash are running out of this. I basically have free rent in my own building. I own, we did a cost seg on it. There's also a million dollars worth of um, bonus depreciation materials inside the building, including the flooring. And because we cost segregated and accelerated the depreciation, I wiped out well over a million, million and a half dollars worth of taxes from that one purchase. Boom, right there, you're like, now I'm playing the money game to win. Yeah, that we discovered that one last year too. Like we bought our first multifamily deal in Tucson, 17 units, did the parcel at the disposition, we did the uh, cost sick, we did the whole thing, same thing, saved a lot of money, it's cash flowing. Like it's, it's, a, it's all it's the a, things. A game changer, right? Like we talked about it for three years, but never really did it. And then we just jumped into it with a friend of ours that's in Tucson. And we're like, you know what, just, let's just do it. And it's, that was probably the best decision. And now we're like, like you kind of like hooked on it. We're like, okay, we need more. We need more. And whether you're buying a private jet and then you're doing the similar things, then putting it into service to make money and cover its costs, you're buying commercial, like what we did. You need to study the rules of the money game. It's not like I'm making this up hundreds and thousands of people have done this before us. We just got to go and figure it out and then go and do it. That's what I love about you guys. You guys are fast implementers, you know, and it's not always just about making more money. It's about keeping more of the money you made. And that's like more, that's more of a mature approach. Yeah. Creating passive income. Where do you see, like in general, we touched like the, the real estate market and now we talk multifamily, commercial, single family flips, everything. Like, where do you see the real estate industry, the market in the next five, 10 years, you know, opportunities also 
you know, also I was going to talk about like, mm. where, where the dangers in, in that industry may be. Like, how do you see the real estate changing or, or playing out the next few years? Yeah, let's start with the positive. Positive is they say that in, in a, a, a human's lifetime, there might be four or five game-changing moments in your life full of this, like, insane shift or opportunity where you can really come up and get just embarrassingly wealthy. Unfortunately, two of them happen before the time you're 16 years old. So you're too young to even know what the hell to do with it. One happens after the time you're 60, 65, and so you really don't give a shit about it. You've already made it, and you're kind of retired, right? So you're really talking about two, maybe two opportunities in your life where you can really, like, lean in on something and take advantage of the opportunity. In 2008, we had one of those, right? And I, got, I made tens of millions of dollars investing in real estate, not really knowing what I'm doing, figuring it out in real time, buying tons of houses. I didn't keep a lot of them. Like I really, if I could go back, I would have kept everything. But I made a lot of money transactionally. I didn't know if I'd ever see it again. But this time, it's happening. When we printed five, over $5 trillion and handed it out, now we have, what is it, over $31 trillion in debt. You got a bunch of bozos in charge. You kind of look around at, at, the, at the world and you're like, dude, we're at peak moron. You know, peak, peak bozo. Yeah. Everybody's just crazy. That's why I don't watch news and I'm not like trying to like, get in debates on social media. You know, I like, really try to protect my peace. But the opportunities over the next few years are going to be massive. Just think about like what's happening with the debt, uh, with uh, interest rates. If interest rates go up by 1%, so if they go from, let's say, 6 to 7%, that's like a 600 to $800 increase in the cost of a mortgage. Right away, people who can afford three or $400,000 houses are immediately fucked. Just by that six, extra six to 800 bucks. That's how living on the edge Americans are. You know, they don't, we don't save any money. We're not taught financial literacy in schools. We got a bunch of libtards in school, socialists, teaching our kids how to be morons and babies and wussies. And I'm just saying it. Like, I'm just calling it what it is. Like, you know, you look, on, you look at what's happening in our schooling system, and you're just like, Phew. this is why I love Clever Investor. This is why I love this podcast, what you guys are doing, because you're exposing people to a, a different frequency of thinking about wealth and control. And so for me, it's like, okay, you got all these, you can't, I can't control any of those things. I can only control what I do on a daily basis. And so step one is increase skills and capabilities. I need to lean in and figure out like where the opportunities are going to be. Well, they're going to be in single family for everybody who refinanced into a three and a half percent mortgage or less. Between 2020 and 2022, over half of all the mortgages refinanced. $5.7 trillion worth. That's 40 million Americans refinanced into this phenomenal mortgage. That's gold. It, why would I ever buy a house and trade a 3% mortgage for an 8% mortgage? Makes no sense. But if I could go talk a seller into participating, into giving me the property with the loan attached to it, I'm, I'm back in the game. Right. That's creative finance. And this is why it's so hot again and... It's funny because back in the 80s, my mentors, that's all they did. They didn't go to banks. They never went to a bank. They hated banks. They only did deals where the sell, it's called seller participation or creative finance. That's all they did. If they own the house free and clear, they loved cutting those deals. Because if I can convince you, you own a house free and clear, we can structure any deal under the sun. I don't need to sign a mountain of paperwork. I don't got to prove two years of job history. I don't got to have good credit. You just got to like me and trust that I'm not going to screw up our arrangement. And even if I do, you just take your house back. Uh, you stay in first position. Though. That's gold. It's I gold. Think. Like, man, what a great deal. So, I mean, there's so many houses free and clear, so many commercial buildings free and clear. That's a big opportunity. On the commercial side of things, a lot of builder, developer, investors, speculators, in the multifamily space specifically, got into these, you know, two-year loans, three-year loans, good interest rates for that period of time. But there's, a, there's a, 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 a sunset on these, a maturity date. And it's coming up over the next year to 18 months. 
And unfortunately, the way the market is with high interest rates and cap rates being compressed and everything, they're, they're screwed. So a lot of these multifamily uh, speculators are going to just try to fire sell and get out of the properties. People that have ca heavy cash that know what they're doing in the multifamily space are going to have a really good time picking apart a lot of these deals. And you got to understand like hedge funds and big money, they're not, they're not looking at smaller deals. They want the bigger deals which leaves a tremendous window for us little guys to go in there and find motivated sellers in the multifamily space and get out, build a relationship with them and take advantage of those opportunities. So that's the good side is there's massive opportunities. This is, you got to understand, this is a zero sum economy. Money never leaves the ecosystem. We, we just inject more into it and it just changes hands. And so it's like, which side are you going to be on? The haves or the have nots? If you have the right skills, if you have the right proximity to good other people, right? Good mentors, good power team members, good uh, uh, money lend partners and all that stuff, you're going to crush it and you're going to make a fortune. You will, you will create generational wealth in the next 24 months if you play this game right. Now, on the bad side, somebody is going to lose. There are winners and losers. And unfortunately, the gap between rich and poor is going to get much wider. We're going to see unemployment skyrocket, probably. We're going to see credit card debt skyrocket. It already is. Student loan debt skyrocketing. People are losing their jobs. And this is just the tremors before the big storm. Because we're not in a real estate crash. Although real estate will crash in certain areas way heavier than others. We're in a currency crash. We're in a currency crisis. And not, this is like a big-ass experiment. None of us really know what the hell is going to happen. I can't control any of that. I can just be prepared as much as I can, limit my liabilities. I have been for the last two years aggressively building my relationships with all my money partners, knowing that this was going to happen. Um, and uh, yeah, just win with grace. Because if you're a good investor, you're going to win, but somebody is going to get hurt. And so my, my hope is that we can help as many people along the way have the softest landing that they can while cutting as best of a deal to still get the deal but not make the other person get their ass kicked too bad you know what i'm saying i think there is a win-win somewhere in there i don't know what do you guys think you think you think the next two years is going to be a, a big big gold rush or well it's it's interesting because everything that you said is pretty much what patrick and i talk on a daily basis we told you we kind of pivoted into some multifamily. we have our investors ready um, a lot of those are from overseas, as you know, from back home. So we, I guess we understand and getting reassurance from you, you know, with all your experience is, is I guess, good to hear that we, that we got, uh, we got the same kind of playlist going on our end. Just be careful as a builder because, you know, builders make a fortune in good times and they go bankrupt in bad times. Interest rates go up two more percent all of a sudden it really starts to hurt. You guys are lucky because you're in such a high price range that these are cash buyers a lot of times. They're very wealthy. They're not really worried about too much, little swings. But if their companies are going down, and a lot of these guys own companies and stuff, that's when you'll know, like, oh, shit, like, we got to be really careful. And I think you guys did one of the smartest things in the world by pre-selling everything, locking in your profits. When you told me that, I was like, my guys, <laughs> because that, that is the best news. Your number one job as a builder is to protect the football before you make a profit. And I think the other thing we, yeah. we learned that took us a minute, but, but the multifamily game, the, you know, like going from, from flips, which is income producing, to multifamily and other stuff that's more passive, right? So that's the last 12 months been really the focus. We bought the first one. We're looking at more. So we're really trying to do those like you said, pre-sell them, take the money out and moving and parking it somewhere where it now makes us, it doesn't make us hundreds of thousands, but it makes us 4,000 a month. And it protects and the money, like you said. That's you it, yeah. yeah. So that's that's the next step for us, yeah. So you mentioned proximity is key, which um, which is one of the first things we also learned from you. So super important um, for us and very thankful for everything you've done for us. It's like paved, uh, paved the way pretty good. And sometimes when we think about the, the good old days when we got started and kind of the deals that we working uh, that we've been working at it's uh, it's crazy to see where we got but it's also crazy to see where where you just like blown up completely so my question and I've always wanted to ask you that at your level you know with multiple businesses you you talk about proximity you talk about mentorship 
So what do you do at your level? Who do you seek out for advice? And I'm not talking about, you know, attorneys and CPAs. Like, yeah, what is your core inner circle and, and how do you um, how do you keep growing and, um, and yeah. to the next level? So the key to breaking into any circle is serving your way to success, right? And I've always done a good job of being very humble um, and being a great servant, you know? And like I said earlier, like the, having that blue check mark and building a personal brand was a game changer for me. It's the call. It's our business card nowadays, right? Like you go into a bar to meet a girl. She doesn't say, give me your phone number. She said, Hey, let me get your IG. Right? Like that's, it's the way people interact now. A lot of times is they want to check you out and go down the rabbit hole and see what you're all about. And, Oh damn, he's got, verified you know it's it's a gift and a curse you know uh and so i'm fortunate because as i when i came up there wasn't a lot of like there nobody rolled out the red carpet there was nobody opening up a major door for me saying walk on in we got you i had to scrap my way into every single relationship like um i wanted to i wanted to launch this product once this is back in like 2011 it was called the mobile marketing machine, the M3, right? And I had I had been using it in my wholesaling business for a long time. I built it in-house, cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars to build, and it was the world's first email and texting platform, okay? For real estate, for, for in the real estate game for sure. It did not exist back in 2009 when I built it. This, we were cutting edge technology and that's how I was selling all my wholesale deals is I was blasting out. Pro now everybody does it. Go back to 2009, nobody did it. I was the first. And so I wanted to launch this product and get a bunch of big guys to do it. Well, at the time, the biggest guys in the space were like Than Merrill, right, from Fortune Builders and uh, Preston Ely who had uh, Freedom Soft and like there was other guys that already had like a big email following and a, a big big following. So I just would fly all over the country and work at their events for free. I'm making millions of dollars as a real estate man. I'm working in the back of the room, setting up chairs and just trying to serve my way into their world, just trying to get them to notice me. So that way at some point we could do some business together. And if we never did, I was okay with that too. But at least I put myself on their radar. Um, so that was in the beginning. I didn't have a lot uh, connections. So I just worked my way into these circles and guess what? They all promoted me and we all made a ton of money. It was cool. Now, years later, there are, now it's more common for masterminds to exist, for coaching and mentoring to exist. I am the first to cut a check to go further faster. I spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every single year joining masterminds, flying all over the place to, um, uh, go to events and hiring consultants and bringing them into my world. Doesn't matter what, if I want to be a better copywriter, I'm going to hire one of the best copywriters in the world for a three day in office experience where they break down copywriting to me and my entire marketing team. If that's 50 K, I know I'll make that back. I don't justify my success by a price tag. A lot of people shortchange their opportunities by, oh, I don't want to spend my last $1,000, my last $5,000, my last $500. It's such a mistake because money does you no good. Skills and capabilities will make you tons more money. That relationship, a lot of times with these guys that I hire as consultants that are like these big speakers or these big guys, like let's say I want to be a better speaker. What if I went to Dean Graciosi and said, dude, you're one of the best public speakers I've ever seen in my life. Can I pay you 50 k for a day? And let's just say he said, okay, and then I spent a day with him. What do you think is going to happen? We're going to build a relationship. Now, it's six months into the future. I got a cell phone number. I can text him. I'm following up. I'm building a relationship. Now we're homies, right? That 50K bought me enough proximity to like be befriend this person. And over time, if I do what I do best, which is build rapport, build a relationship, serve my way there, I've now turned that 50K into millions of dollars worth of benefits because of our relationship. I'm connect I hear something in one of our conversations that he needs. I connect him with another person. Boom, next thing you know, I'm adding value into his life and he'll never forget it. And I'm just, I'm giving Dean as an example because he's one of my favorite people that has coached me over the years. Um, 
who's become a dear friend. And uh, now he's partner, business partners with Tony Robbins. He runs all of Tony's companies. He runs mastermind.com and is one of the best speakers and sales guys in the world. His companies and brands have done over a billion dollars. I'd pay Dean half a million dollars to learn what I learned from him because it made me millions and millions of dollars. So um, right now I'm in, I run two high level masterminds. My business partners are some of the biggest guys in the game. Um, the big, like everybody from like, like we are Avengers mastermind. My partners are Bobby Castro has 900 million, a, a billion dollars worth of real estate. Kent Clothier, who's out of San Diego, great entrepreneur and a fellow real estate guru. Um, Ryan Stuman, the hardcore closer, he has the largest group on Facebook for sales experts. Uh, Cole Hatter actually worked for Than Merrill and it helped build out Than Merrill's roadshow, has sold hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars from stage. Joel Marion exited his business, Biotrust, for hundreds of millions of dollars. Dan Fleischman's the most connected guy I've ever met in my life. I'll be kicking it with Dan Fleischman and like Mark Wahlberg will call him. Like it's just wild shit. Like the Kardashians will call him. You're like, what the frick, dude? <laughs> uh, but it's cool. You know, he called me yesterday and he's like, dude, I'm in town. I said, okay, cool. He's like, but I can't talk. I'm in a high stakes all night poker tournament. I'm like, do I want to know who's in the room? He's like, I can't tell you, but they're all big dogs. He's just connected, you know, and it's just um, uh, Pace Morby, Jamil Damji, they're on hit TV shows. We know them very well. They're amazing local investors. I mean, just like I'm very lucky. I can, my Rolodex is strong now. Like, if, like I just hired Erwin McManus, who is one of the best pastors in the country, wrote him a check for 30 grand to be in a private Christian men's group because I'm really, like, I'm trying to build my spiritual muscle. And it's not about organized religion for me. It's not about Christianity. It's about being around other men that are spiritual. And I've been praying a lot. I do a, I, I've been going to church a lot. I don't hear anything back yet. It's like a one-way conversation with God. But I attack my business where I hire coaches. I attack my health where I hire coaches. Why don't I hire coaches for my spiritual side? And so I've just kind of applied that to a bunch of areas of my life that I want to strengthen to build that muscle. And so uh, we are meeting for the first time here in a month or two. The 20 other guys all that wrote a $30,000 check, they're guys you know. They're best-selling authors. They're celebrities. They're some of the biggest in the world. So I'm going to get other benefit out of that besides just spirituality. I'm going to bro out on a spiritual level with some of the biggest players in the, in the game. If I want to talk to Ed Milet, I text him. You know, I got a lot of really cool people on, on my, on, in my phone handful of billionaires and a handful of people that you would never know and then a bunch of people that you do and it all is because I built a personal brand I'm loud as hell on social media they know who I am and I served my way into their world I'll give you another just quick example and then we can move on but if any of my friends launch a book I'm the first like a, and they're trying to hit the like New York Times bestseller or anything I'm the first one to buy a hundred thousand dollars worth of books Like, Ed launches a book, I'm writing him a 90K check. Not him, but I'm buying $90,000 worth of fucking books. And I'm going to hand them out to everybody. Yeah, give away, so. yeah, it's he didn't ask me to do that. I do it because I want to do I want to support my friends. You think he's ever going to forget that? I mean, how many people in your life would just buy 100K worth of books? Not many. But I'll do it. Not because I, it's not like I want to spend 100K on fucking books. I know that it's a power move. And I know that it, it sends a signal like I'm, I'm in the game to play with the big boys. Right. You know, and he'll never forget it. And now he takes my calls. I don't call him all the time, you know, but. He, you got to be he, careful. Yeah, 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 I'm very, I'm very selective. But he, and he's phenomenal. And by the way, his book is one of the best books I've ever read in my freaking life. So it, I'm proud to hand it out to people. Hey, check out this book, The One, man. It's so freaking good. Very cool, very cool. So we, we talked a lot about business. Um, one thing that we get like asked a lot about, like as a business owner, you don't really get a trophy or, you know, like nobody pets you on your shoulder when you do good, right? If an employee, employee of the month or something, right? What do you do for yourself to like celebrate victories or to not 
because it's very easy to do good and not really see it yourself sometimes like how do you celebrate your successes like what <laughs> by yourself what do you like doing like yeah you know here's here i'm i've designed my life i'm not trapped in a job i don't like i'm not around people that i don't care for everybody in my proximity at this level at this stage is handpicked hand selected and i'm so grateful to be around them when i when i can be around them from my team members to my partners to my friends that I do business with. Um, I float into work every day. Even the challenging days, I'm so grateful for them that I get to do life with all these people that are around me. So I never feel like I need an escape. There is never a moment where I'm like, God, if I could just get the fuck away from these people. Right. It's never like that for me. Um, and I love what I do. I love the impact. I love the hard time. Like, I'm going through a lot of hard times right now. I'm happier than I've ever been. And I'm happy because I'm in alignment with my purpose. And when you get to that stage in life where you're really, truly in alignment with your purpose, like, I'm not doing this for the money. I'm doing this because this is my calling. I believe in it. I love it. The impact is there. I'll take the... I get paid to solve big problems. And I get paid a lot more to solve bigger problems. And so it's like, fucking bring it. Like this, when I said earlier, this the year of energy, and I want to be ripped rich and rare, like that's how I'm attacking 2023. Like 2022 was hard for a lot of people. They suffered in silence. You know, we came out of COVID. We were trying to figure out like, what, is all, what does this all mean for us? We're at peak depression, peak divorce rate, peak running out of money because we blew through all the free handouts. And, uh, Credit cards are getting maxed again, and people are getting scared. The economy's sh shaky. It's like, what does this all mean? Uh, my big fear is that over the next few years, like more people will kill themselves than ever before. More people will go through a divorce than ever before. More people get hooked on drugs than ever before. So it's like, you know, I'm not out there trying to, like, escape and go on some vacation. I do like nice cars. I'm obviously a fucking sucker for nice watches. Um, but it's very rare that I buy something nice like right now i drive a tesla i got rid of all my lambos my rolls royce my porsche i got rid of everything a few years ago like i went through that phase it was a cool phase it's fun to like ball out for a minute but then you kind of step back and you're like dude you know what i really did i built a luxury prison like that's really what i did for myself i didn't feel any happier i didn't feel better about myself it was like a you know it was it was, it was short-lived I like pulling in and I like pulling out of the spot because everybody looks at you like, oh, fuck, he's got a Rolls. It felt better to give that car away than to own that car. It felt better to sell those things than to own those things. I value freedom. That's really when I am my happiness. My happiness. Also, last year, going through losing my mom and going through a divorce, which is hard, you know, after 18 years to go, and I'm still finalizing it. Um, I'm on this mission uh, to be the best dad in the world, to be the healthiest I've ever been, to make the most impact I've ever made, to give away more money than I've ever given away, serving causes that I care about, um, being a great co-parent, like the world's greatest co-parent, um, and just stay in that pocket where I'm in alignment with my purpose. And just be happy. Like, to me, that's more important than anything else. Well, we're, we're about to wrap it up. I guess before we last, we ask the last question. A quick, I uh, want to do something quick with you. This or that. You ready? Fix and, <laughs> fix and flip or buy and hold? Oh, fuck. Buy and hold. Multi-family or single family? Multi-family. Bitcoin or blue chip? Fuck. I, uh, Bitcoin. Watches or cars? Cars. Growth or security? Growth. Work early or work late? What does that mean? You want to like to work early or you like to work late? I'm 24-7. I love it. Yeah. Pay a raise or pay a bonus? Bonus. Let's fucking earn it. Owe a favor or owe money? Mm, that's a tough one. Uh, owe a favor. Speed or accuracy? Speed. Yeah, very cool. So one last, last question that we always ask everybody. Um, if you could 
talk to your own self, 18-year-old Cody, like what's the advice you would give the young version of yourself, knowing everything you know yeah, now? Yeah, great question. I would actually go to 13-year-old Cody because that's when I was m- probably the s- most scared, the most insecure. And I would tell that kid to put in the real work necessary to unconditionally love yourself. A lot of men go through life carrying a tremendous amount of pain that they cover up by toughening it out. This toxic masculinity kind of angle. We, we got to be tough. We can't cry. We can't show our emotions. We got to be tough. And um, I would tell that kid, look, what happened to you growing up happened to you. And it happened to you probably for a reason, to prepare you for all the blessings and opportunities coming in your future and that this strength that you're gathering now is going to serve you really well later in life. But don't make the unfortunate mistake by taking all of that pain and never addressing it and then growing up to be this adult that is a professional compartmentalizer and barrier of that pain. I hid my... I used my pain growing up as um, a reason to be successful. I hid my pain in achievement, which served me really well, but it also limited me from really exploding. I should be 10 times bigger than I am right now, 10 times more impactful, 10 times wealthier. It wasn't until hitting rock bottom last year with my mom dying and my relationship imploding did I finally go and get counseling, go to therapy, go work on my inner child, like really go deep. So deep, like I hadn't cried in years and years and years. And in 2022, I cried the whole fucking year, you know? And then here I am now, I'm at church last weekend bawling and it felt so fucking good. It just felt amazing just to be able to release. Um, I'm more powerful than I've ever been. I'm, like I said, I'm happier than I've ever been. And it's because I put in the real work necessary to unconditionally love myself. And I wish I would have done that a lot sooner. Because when you roll through life like that, when I can, I can give only what I have for myself. I can't unconditionally love you until I unconditionally love me. Right? I can't be the best mentor to you until I'm actually following my own fucking advice. You know? And, and nothing is sadder than a man that can't keep a promise to himself. And we see it happen all the time. Some dude at the pool with a Rolex on, killing it in the money game, but his family hates him. And he's fat as fuck, and he's wearing a T-shirt, and he's got he's hiding his man titties, and he's just embarrassed, right? Like he's an embarrassing dude. You wouldn't trade places with him, no matter how nice his watch is. But ripped, rich, and rare, or being that guy that has a six pack and a million bucks, and a great relationship with his kids, and a great relationship with his creator, and has his intimacy circles actually dialed in, and like really is powerful. Like today. How many people have you texted today that are friends that you sent texts out to telling them how much you love them and how impressed you are with them and, 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 and what a great friend they are. And you just wanted to make them smile by this text. I send five out to five different friends every day of the week because that's the first thing I want them to wake up and see not fucking negative news, not some bullshit email, not playing defense. Like I want them to read that text from Cody Sperber and be like, God, that guy's dope. I, I, I am pretty dope too. Because I'm rattling off all the shit I love about them. You know, like that. that's the kind of friend I want to be. On all levels, playing full out. And so that's what I would tell that 13-year-old is go put in the real fucking work. Not the go get rich work, but like really, really learn how to like unblock your subconscious programming that we've inherited from our parents or inherited from our environment and learn how to really be powerful. Cool. I think that's a that's a good closing statement. We'll we'll uh, wrap it up here. Um, thank you for coming, Cody. Obviously, um, where do people find you on social media? You want to give a quick rundown? Yeah, at Clever Investor on all social channels. And since this is a podcast, I launched my new podcast, The Clever Investor Show. Love the I love doing podcasts, man. I'm having a ton of fun. It's a very creative outlet. Appreciate you guys having me on yours. Uh, by the way, go give these guys five star reviews, please. If you got something from this podcast, the way you serve back to me is give them a five-star review and and put in the little comment section that the Cody Sperber episode was your favorite one so far and that that you loved it. And, you know, maybe share it with a couple of your friends that are entrepreneurs or investors that want to hear this. But that's it, man. I don't don't have anything to sell them. Uh, Just 
Come check out my podcast, The Clever Investor Show. To, uh, I don't know, when, when, when is this going to come out? Soon? Uh, probably a week or two, yeah. Okay, cool, yeah. Um, uh, I drop every Thursday. My epi- new episodes drop every Thursday. I just had Robert Kiyosaki on. He's dropping this week. Very cool. Yeah, we'll obviously put all the description in the link below where you can find them. Um, and we're going to link to your channel as well. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, I think we have the title for this one. This is going to be Rip Rich and Rare, right? So yeah, and that's title. a Wes Watson thing. That's not a Cody Sperber thing. I'm giving him credit where credit's due. But, yeah, let's go, baby. We'll use it for the episode. <laughs> I'm turning 40 soon, so I'm going to use that for my year coming up. So thank you for that tagline. Um, and then, yeah, everybody, make sure you subscribe and like and comment. And uh, we'll see you in the next one.